David Heine, and today we're at the PAN. Uh, we're going to talk with Cornelie Longhout. She's going to give us a little insight into the organization itself, which is quite elaborate, I'm sure. Cornelie, um, first maybe you could tell us, uh, how do you get this all together, all these exhibition uh, and exhibitors? Well, we start about a half a year before the fair, and uh, I particularly work for uh, press and publicity, but uh, one of the major things is the organization of the floor plan, so that uh, every exhibitor is happy with the place he has. And uh, that is major work. Now, how many exhibitors do you have, in fact? We have 110 exhibitors, of which uh, 10 are from Belgium. And uh, as I walk around the fair, I see a number of these are very elaborate, so these people must take quite some time to uh, set up. Yes, well, um, participating at Pan Amsterdam, they, they, they really enjoy it very much. So they uh, prepare the collection for Pan Amsterdam, well, as soon as the fair ends, really, and they start f for the next year. Um, they are very uh, happy to, to be here and to uh, meet all the visitors uh, at Pan Amsterdam and uh, they are um, really doing their utmost to get the best collection they have. Now who exactly does exhibit at Pan Amsterdam? Well, uh, next to the fact they, they're either Dutch or uh, Belgian, um, we have art dealers who, who deal in old master paintings, uh, 19th century paintings. Uh, we have uh, gallerists uh, who deal in modern and contemporary art. And we have antique dealers who deal, well, you know, silver, um, ceramics, uh, Eastern ceramics, but also European ceramics, furniture, um, Asian art, um, and uh, classical antiquities, wh whatever, uh, almost everything. It's an enormous variety here. It's a very com comfortable atmosphere that you've created here. Uh, could you tell me how many people usually come annually? Um, it tends to vary around uh, 28,000. And uh, so one year it's uh, up a little bit, the next year it's down a little bit. So we try to reach the 30,000, which is really a, a, plat a platform which you want to break through. But th no, it's, it doesn't happen yet. Now I notice we're standing here in the lobby and you have a, a kind of special collection here. Could you tell us a little about that? Uh, yes. Uh, these works, what are about 20 uh, paintings, are from the Peter Stuyvesant collection, which is a corporate uh, art collection. And um, the Peter Stuyvesant um, started the collection in 1960 for decorating the, uh, the premises where the um, uh, products were, were made, so uh, above the machines, and that is also why they are hanging so uh, high, they are hanging so high. Dutch have um, a long tradition in collecting, especially Chinese porcelain, by the simple fact that we, um, we founded in the 17th century the, the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, and they were the second after the Portuguese to sail to China and trade um, the porcelain with the Chinese. And um, so, for instance, the, um, most of the houses built in Amsterdam were built by fortunes made uh, in the trade with China, Indonesia, India, uh, that area. And the Dutch were uh, fairly good at sailing this, the seas. So, uh, it's quite obvious that they went that way and came back with these sort of objects. Now, you have some exquisite items here. Uh, what is your specialty? Uh, our specialty is export porcelain or chine de commande. So that's typical um, porcelain made for the European countries, mostly uh, Holland, Belgium, England. Uh, sometimes Scandinavian countries, that is our speciality. Now I notice that you have some figurines here. Um, many of them appear to be very old based on uh, my observation and the patina that uh, seems... Uh, what do you have with you here today? Um, we have... Uh, should I point out something? Or? Oh, just tell me. Okay. 
We, the, the collection is actually divided in two sections. One is the export porcelain, the other one is uh, early terracotta objects. Uh, we have a very nice group of soldiers uh, that is lined up like, a real, like real soldiers do. Uh, they even have a, uh, an officer with them, uh, which is very rare to find as a group. And by and large, uh, as I look around, how old are some of these objects from China? Um, some of the objects are as old as two and a half thousand years BC, which is uh, the early, early stage of terracotta production in China. I noticed that you have a large, what appears to be a bell over to my right. Uh, could you tell me a little about that? Yes. Uh, the bell is, is uh, quite rare. It's cast iron. The interesting part is that it's dated from uh, 1554. There, there are an awful lot of Chinese characters on the outside of the bell. And the story behind that is that the names of the, uh, the people who put money together to actually have the bell cast. And um, they always have the, the name of the emperor that rules at the time and the date. And there's always a wish of prosperity and a good harvest and fertile soil, which makes it uh, interesting as a piece of art, but also the art historical background uh, of the bell. A little about Pan. Uh, have you been coming to Pan long, and wh what is Pan to you? Pan is the, uh, the Dutch national fair. It's actually a reflection of the art and antiques of the lowlands, which is Holland and Belgium. Um, our company is one of the founders of the Pan Fair, uh, so we've been doing it from day one. And um, here we meet our clientele mainly from Holland, Belgium, and sometimes uh, people from Germany as well, and the odd uh, people who do come to Amsterdam and visit the fair. One of the highlights of the Pan Fair is a Van Gogh, brought by the Nordman Gallery of Maastricht. This is a Van Gogh from the early days in Paris. With us today is Jill Cabianca. It's a picture, in fact, that we have sold before. Um, we had bought it privately many years ago, uh, it was sold eventually to a private collector in Japan in the late 80s and um, was offered back to us again. So it's always been in private hands as far as our experience has been uh, with it. And um, when we had the opportunity to buy it again, uh, we, we took it. Now with the person art these days, um, I notice none of your paintings and you have some beautiful Renoirs and Redons and things that you would almost expect to see in a museum. I notice you don't put prices on them. Do, do, they must have a wide range, and do the people come and talk to you about that? They do or? have a wide range. If you go around the fair, most people don't put prices. Uh, when it's, There's no hard and fast rule, but say above 10,000 guilders, you don't see many things with a price tag on them. It's really each uh, dealer's choice. It does encourage people, first of all, to talk to us about the pictures. And it also, I think, is a statement from us saying that it's, it's not just the pricing of a picture that's important. Yes, these things are for sale, of course, this is our living, but look at the art. We want people to look at the art, not look at the price tag. Well, it's a very beautiful display of paintings you have here. Are these frames that I see so many of them in, are, are many of those original? Or there is this are some, some that are original. There are some that are what we call period frames. In other words, they are the type of thing that would be on the picture, and they happen to have been carved uh, and made at the time, but they are not necessarily the frame that was original to the picture. Um, we try, especially well, with all of them, to be as close as possible to the originals. It is a little bit easier to frame our 19th century things. There are more uh, 19th century, uh, excuse me, not 19th century frames, but there are more gilt frames available um, that were period frames. Um, a lot of the Dutch frames have not survived. Very many of them have been cut down or broken up. Um, fashion changed also uh, very much for Dutch frames in the 17th to the 18th century. Um, so there are all these choices of how one frames, and people have different uh, opinions as to what frame is appropriate. But we try to be as faithful as possible and put something on it that we find both aesthetically pleasing and proper. Um, if we cannot find an original, we have something usually carved uh, by hand and gilded and, and made in an old-fashioned way for the frames, for the pictures. 
We're in Rulos of Amsterdam dealing old masters. With us today is Carlo van Oosterhout. Carlo, tell me something about dealing in old masters. Are there a lot of them still available? No, um, not a lot. Uh, est estimations have been made in the past and uh, we think that maybe 1% of what has been made is still left and still only a small part of this is on the market. So not really that much and especially of a good quality, no, no, not that much really. No. Now you told me that uh, you feel your uh, shop actually has some of the finest quality uh, available. Do you primarily deal in Dutch painters? Primarily in Dutch painters, yes, that's correct. Some of them, uh, some painting, painters are French, some of them German, but mostly Dutch, yes, that's right, 17th century, yes. Why was the Dutch 17th century old masters so important in the world of art? Well, something quite unique happened uh, in the 17th century. Uh, of course, uh, Holland became a free country. Uh, with a lot of free trade going on, a lot of money became available and all of a sudden uh, something exploded somehow. Uh, it's really something very, very mysterious but all of a sudden in a lot of Dutch cities painter, painters of good quality emerged and it really made, started making impressive paintings, really became famous worldwide rather quickly and now yes, we have some, some of them left still. Now, who are some of the painters that you have represented here? Uh, well, we have uh, a painter, uh, for instance, Nicolas Maas, who was a pupil of uh, Rembrandt. And we have a beautiful still life of him. Uh, it's the only still life uh, he, he probably has ever made. Uh, other example, Albert Kuyp, a very important Dutch master of the 17th century. Uh, his first painting, probably. Well, his first known painting, dated and signed. Um, beautiful still life by Jan van Meulen. It's not very much known of him, but he's a painter of superb quality. Only a few examples. Now, we recently did a show at the Rijksmuseum of Still Lives, which yes. is a wonderful show of still lives yes. gathered from all around the yes. world. Uh, the subject matter seemed oftentimes to be everyday life in Holland. Uh, is this uh, what you find? That's true, that's correct. Everyday life, but um, with a religious overtone. We're with Simon Morsink from the Jan Morsink uh, Iconen Gallery in Amsterdam, and he's going to tell us a little about the, the beautiful icons that he has here in his shop. Simon, tell me first, uh, what is the history of icons? Of icons in general? Um, the first icons we know were painted in the 5th, 6th century uh, in Byzantium. So it, it all started in uh, Byzantium, Constantinople. Um, there are but a few left of these icons, only 10, 12 icons. They are mainly kept in the uh, Catherine Monastery in uh, the desert of uh, Sinai. And um, after that you had the, uh, in the 8th, 9th century the iconoclasm in Byzantium where most of the icons were uh, destroyed and the frescoes. It was a, um, uh, a very difficult period where it was forbidden to uh, paint icons. And uh, after that, the uh, veneration of icons was uh, restored. It was still, it was possible again to paint icons. And um, at the end of the 10th century, the uh, art of icon painting came to Russia, together with Christianity. And what you can see in our gallery and in our stand here at the Palm Amsterdam are mainly Russian icons. Let's digress a little bit here. What exactly is an icon? An icon is an uh, image of uh, Christ, uh, a saint, um, the mother of God, or uh, episodes from their lives, painted on panel um, according to the uh, orthodox tradition. That's kind of a definition. Now they have a very special uh, place in the Russian uh, religion themselves, don't they? Uh, could you tell us a little about that? They're uh, ess essential. It is uh, impossible for a uh, Russian Orthodox believer to uh, live uh, without an icon. He has icons at home, 
in the so-called uh, red or beautiful corner and in the church, uh, of course, and also when he's traveling, he's always uh, wearing uh, an icon with him, a small traveling icon. So it's, he is um, surrounded by icons uh, during his life. Um, by his birth, he gets an uh, icon as a present, and when he's uh, marrying, he's, he's getting another icon, and so it's part of life, uh, of daily life in Russia. How can we explain the continued popularity of icons here in the West, where it's such a secular society? That's difficult to say. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's uh, one of the things is that people are more and more interested in, in religion and uh, the mystery, um, maybe because of the uh, our very empirical uh, uh, society. Uh, and everything is, especially here in Holland, is a very cold society. Everybody is working very hard and I think a little icons are very warm, uh, warm colors, beautiful expressions, and I think people like that more and more. Often uh, my own definition of art feel, uh, runs to uh, something that gives you calm and solace mm -hmm. in it, and uh, would you say that's what icons can do for people? Yes, yeah, sure. Not for everybody, of course, but uh, people that uh, are open for this kind of art, they are very calm and, and when they see it, it's, yeah, they like it. I notice we're, we're here at a, a place where you're a gallery that sells icons. Uh, what does an average icon uh, cost? It starts at about uh, four or five thousand uh, Dutch guilders and um, for the 19th century icons and it goes up till uh, about 300, 400,000 guilders. And then you're talking about really beautiful early 15th, 16th century icons. These are very rare and very expensive. Now, here at the fair, you've uh, brought a very unusual uh, piece. Uh, could you describe that a little bit for yes, us? Yes, it's, uh, it's quite exceptional indeed. It's an uh, icon of St. Nicholas, and it's not a uh, flat icon. Officially, it was forbidden in the Orthodox Church to paint, of, to make uh, three-dimensional uh, images, uh, sculptures. But this is a uh, sculpture of uh, St. Nicholas, um, painted as an icon, but in three dimensions, and it's quite rare. Well, Simon, where is your gallery in Amsterdam located? It's at uh, Keizersgracht 454 uh, in Amsterdam. Hello, we're with uh, Matisse Etonnet, uh, the gallery Rob Vandendal. They're in The Hague and they specialize in contemporary glass, some very beautiful Dale Chihuly pieces behind us. Uh, Matisse, maybe you could tell me uh, a little about your gallery. Yeah, we have a gallery almost for 20 years now. Started in The Hague and still in The Hague. And we participate uh, in the Pan Amsterdam already 12 years. And we are specialized in contemporary glass art. And we make about 20 shows a year from artists from Holland and also artists from abroad. And here you see uh, Dilje Hulie's work, it's an, an artist from the United States. Now, we, we look around here at the show and we see crystal from uh, the 17th century Holland. This isn't exactly what you're doing here, is it? It's more along the lines of art than uh, glasses. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's still crystal, that's the same, but it's all made in the last 10 years, and it's all so it's called contemporary, and all made by uh, artists who are still living, and we are still making, and it, 
it's different from other uh, other crystal you see on the fair here, but it's, uh, it, it's all contemporary. Yes. So, how would you describe Dale Tehulle's work? It's marvelous. It's fantastic. In uh, in the, it's difficult to to, un, to describe in English, but uh, it looks with many colors and uh, all his feeling, all his passion which he has in his work, in his life, he will he put it in his work. It's uh, colorful, many pieces, many parts. It's outstanding. Yes. Now, inside your gallery, you have other artists. Could you tell us a little about them? Yes, we have uh, not only uh, artists from abroad, but also a couple of uh, young Dutch artists. And uh, we try to promote them also in foreign in the foreign countries, like the United States. We bring up Dutch uh, artists. And they're all doing uh, nice things, blown glass, cut and polished glass, uh, m- melting techniques. In, in Holland, we have a, a very huge, uh, many artists who are doing contemporary glass. And all make, has own special specialties. And if you see it uh, through the world, they're getting more and more famous. And in Holland are many artists and we do a good job in Holland. Yes, with them. I notice you have a lot of diversity in the uh, patrons or the, the, the people visiting the, uh, that are going in and out of your gallery here. Uh, who primarily is interested in modern glass art? Interesting is, interested is everybody. And you see that uh, uh, if the light is on, everybody looks and likes it very much. Yesterday we had 15 minutes no light and then the people walk away. But if the light is on, it's completely crowded the whole day. And from young till old, and uh, all, everybody likes it. And also young and older people collect it. It depends on the on prices, of course, if you can afford a glass piece. But it starts uh, not so expensive. You can go up to very expensive pieces, as you see at Dil Chihuly, because he's very famous. But you can also buy an, an, a cheaper, uh, cheaper glass piece from a less famous, a young artist. So it's, uh, it's for everybody. Now one of my favorite pieces here in the front is this Dale Chihuly with the putti. What would that cost me if I was interested in buying it? If I tell the Dutch guilders, it is, I think, 135,000 guilders. It's a very rich piece, a very nice piece. And uh, the price is because Dill is famous, but also the price because the putties, you don't make so much putties. And there are, uh, there are a few, and a, and a few are very nice. And he, uh, it's typical Dill, it's typical, he's, uh, he's not doing, he's blowing himself. He lets uh, a Venetian glassblower come over from Venice, uh, Pino Cineretti, and he's going to Seattle to make it together with him. And together they make the nice combination, it's called uh, the putty with the blowfish. Yes. Well, Matisse, thank you very much for taking some time and explaining contemporary glass art to us. Thank you. What kind of art patrons are, are interested in the, these paintings? Um, um, every citizen, actually. That means every citizen that has his own uh, opinion and uh, has the courage to listen to, uh, to his or her heart. So once you are confronted with such a painting and you can afford it, you buy it. Now, art developments in the 20th century have been what we consider in many ways the, the evolution of painting, uh, the breaking down of uh, figurative paintings and into an abstract expressionism or Carl Apple's uh, playful psychological kind of art. Here we have uh, what is uh, obviously the descendant of the Dutch old masters. And yet it has a contemporary form. Uh, How do you think that they get a freshness into these paintings? Can you say it again? Uh, They seem fresh even. Yes, well, I think that's just the mentality. Uh, but there's an interesting story concerning this question about this painter. His starting point was just trying to copy the old masters. Just literally copy them. And slightly in the course of the years, his style changed. It wasn't his intention at all, but he was passionate with a while painting. And so um, his mind mixed, uh, his, his, well, how can I say this, this 
impulse, is that an English word? Mm -hmm. this contemporary impulse, mix it with the old traditions, with the old values, and see, there it, it became contemporary. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Could you tell me, Con, uh, some of the painters that you represent and a little of their history? Uh, yes, well, um, the one I cooperate the longest is uh, Theo Voorzaat. Uh, he walked into the gallery in 1972 and his first exhibition well, was a year later and his very small paintings cost about five to eight hundred guilders. Now a painting like this costs 16,000. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, cultural historical uh, um, uh, insights. Anyhow, uh, it proves that the, the, the collector was interested in his works. Uh, well, there is now something coincidental that's very strange. He just finished a painting that shows the Rijksmuseum, but the, uh, but the condition is disastrous. <laughs> So that's make, that makes me say, will, uh, will the Rijks Museum still exist in the, in not only in the year 2000, but the year 3000? So after, what will happen in this millennium with this museum? <laughs> Some of the other ones you have is Annika van Brussel, right? Annika van Brussel, also very popular. Uh, actually, I have the, the small group I represent, so about 15 artists, are all very, uh, very popular. They all have their own big circle of collectors and um, passionate lovers, yes. And yes, uh, uh, Ben Snyder is the one who has actually a special show now and that will be continued on an exhibition after the fair in the gallery. And Alex de Vrede, did you see the Trump Lie paintings uh, in front of the, in the booth? Yes, <laughs> that's also beautiful. And then the miniatures on the other side of this wall, also unbelievable. Van Cairo by, by Cairo Sirach. Yes, also very good. Now, is this a, a school of painting that you would call it? Uh, do we know it by some name? <coughs> Well, I don't know it. Um, uh, the way I made my choice was just guided by personal preference. If this has some cultural meaning, we'll see after 10, 20, 30 or 50 years. I hope so, but anyhow, this is what I like. I bring this together and uh, apparently it's uh, recognized. Yes. Well, thank you again for talking with us. You're welcome.